Thank you. Obrigado. Um, greetings, everyone. My name is Elsie. Um, Hunter Falk, if you want to try to tackle that last name, but really nobody uses it. Um, and I'm so glad you guys were able to join me. Uh, what I, Duarte's text is actually my favorite of the horsemanship texts, um, largely because it gets into so much of the philosophy that I think writing sort of instills in a person. And one of my favorite things to do in the SCA is actually allow folks to get some experience working with horses and interacting with them in a way that often in our urban world we don't get a chance. So the, the video that you're seeing playing, this is actually, uh, well, I'd say it's me messing around with my husband Squire, but it's actually my horse messing around with my husband Squire because I had very little to do with this. This was mostly Moose and Lars having a good time practicing ground and mounted combat together as we got used to things and he used some of the things he knows how to do. So really my, my goals are to kind of introduce you guys to the text. I'm hoping to encourage you guys to pick it up and, and take a peek at it if you have an interest in 15th century Portugal because I think it has a lot to show people beyond horses. Um, horses, of course, are magic and we're always happy to have those. So these are my research partners. Uh, the horse on the chestnut right here is Fresno's Chocolate Moose. And over here, we have Nick, who is my mule, who's rock solid. And both of these are fantastic horses or equids for different reasons. Uh, one of the important things that comes into play is actually the difference in what a hackney was in period versus what a hackney is now. So Nick is a super steady mount. Um, super smooth, easy to ride. This quote that's here in the center, uh, Dorte was actually talking about how you introduce young riders, in his case, young boys to horses, and starting them off on steady ones and moving them up to increasingly difficult horses to ride. And he really talked about, you know, well, once you've got them up to the, the better horse, don't ever let them step back down to the easy horses like the hackneys. I have come to the conclusion, beyond the idea that breeds, animal breeds are mostly a Victorian concept as we think about them modernly, the other conclusion that I have is I think that Moose actually has a persona in which he thinks he's a courser or a hunt type horse, uh, more so than he's a, a period hackney. So if we look a little bit to uh, introduce you guys to Duarte. Um, Duarte the first was a king of Portugal. He was sometimes known as the philosopher king. Uh, he actually was of Portuguese and English descent. He spent time in Great Britain as a youth, and there are some references to writers from that area in the book, and that's when he had a chance to see them most likely. Uh, he also was a com mounted combatant, a soldier, a knight. He uh, earned his spurs in a campaign in North Africa. He married later in life, relatively, and in the, the time period before then, or actually even during his marriage, when his father would go out on campaign, he actually would take on some running of the government during that time period. So he was more than just a playboy crown prince. He actually was a statesman all along and brought seemingly a great deal of thought to the position. He himself only reigned for five years uh, and he died of the plague. He had a large influence in terms of his offspring throughout Europe going on to very lofty elevated positions. The text itself, uh, there is a single extant copy of this work. It was done, as far as we can tell, it was done as a presentation piece for his wife. Uh, and she took it with her when she left Portugal at his death. And within that work, there are actually two. Um, there's Bem Cavalgar, and there is Loyal Counselor, which really was a lot about the philosophy of reigning. So we're going to focus on the work of writing, but it's really largely a philosophical text as well. Uh, I have a link to this work it, in the other resources at the end of this presentation. If you guys want to find it online, the whole, whole thing is, is available. We are actually very fortunate to have 
uh, three different editions by two different translators of this work. And, and each is a little bit subtly different. Uh, the 2006 and 2011 editions were obviously the first ones done. To me, they read a little more like having a conversation with one of my buddies from the Azores, um, who's obviously a native Portuguese speaker, but speaking English. There's a, a pattern to the language and the diction that I find very familiar in that regard. Uh, there's some cultural stuff that I find a little more useful for the 2006 translation. The 2016 translation is generally a little bit better regarded in terms of the scholarship behind it. Uh, it's also a little more readable as an English language. You kind of just sit down, sit down and turn the pages and it makes sense. Uh, there are a couple of things you have to be careful with that I've tripped across in that. And one of the caveats is important. This quote is actually from Duarte himself. The, the standard modern way of saying this would be that you can't learn to ride or you can't teach a horse from a book. That's, that's effectively what Duarte is telling us here. And, and he actually covers a lot of good things in here, but a lot of it's not super technical. It's not the underlying details. In fact, the introduction highlights the idea that you maybe need to know a little bit about horses to understand some of the depth that's going on. There's, there's a, a bit of advice here and there, but it really is not a specific, this is how you ride a horse kind of text. There are also a few mistakes. Um, for example, in the introduction of the 2016 edition, there's a, a section on spurs. And I think most of us in the SCA know what a spur looks like. And it goes on to talk about the stirrup iron and being secured to the foot. So this is actually a stirrup. This is a spur. There's a couple mislabeled photos. So if you come across something in the text that seems a little off to you, it, it may actually be off and just check, double check with somebody. They might be able to go confirm your suspicions. So this particular one, comparing the two translations, I spoke a little bit about, you know, I tend to work predominantly out of the 2016 one, but every once in a while I'll come across something. I had shared this quote with a friend who makes shoes, and he came back and asked how something could be slender and broad at the same time, and I went, huh, that's a really good question. So I went back and I reread the uh, Prado and Prado translation, and I went thin and wide, thin and wide. And then I thought about it a little bit. And we'll give this just a minute for the uh, video to play. Give it a little kickstart. All right, so effectively, there we go. And if we start the other side, I think back to on the other side, I think back to the things like Ryan in California. And what you found is So I think what he was referring to was not so much the width of the shoe, but the gauge or the thickness of the sole leather and how it would provide support and keep the rider from fatiguing. So this is my firefly warning for the book. Um, this book is unfinished. Uh, there are large chunks of it that he didn't get to, and I think that might be part of the reason a lot of the technical guides aren't there. But the information that he did get down comes through with a very strong point of view in terms of what he thinks a horseman should be and how he thinks horsemanship relates to um, the upper class culture. 
these were the planned contents of the text. Uh, the text that's in green are the portions that he actually got around to writing. So we have those to look upon, but there's a, a few key things in there. I would like to hear what he had to say about these were the planned contacts, certainly bits and mouths. You know, a lot of those are details as a writer that I would have we had those to found very useful. But the portions that he did write, I there's a certain amount of I would like to hear what he had to say about contact. I, there's a certain amount of worked extensively with animals um, as a tool for everything that he does. Um, going through the work, the author himself recommends taking really he's designed this as scholarly text, not something that's a quick and simple read. So these are actually the portions that were written and how everything was broken up. Repeatedly, you will see this repetition of the will, the power, and here it's main recommendations, but a lot of times it's called the knowledge. So the things you need to know about writing. We're only going to be able to get through a few portions today. We have limited time. So we're going to focus in on these five green highlighted areas um, as they are the main areas and within the knowledge, they are the areas that he covered most extensively. Again, great will, adequate ability, much knowledge. These three themes are something that he repeats throughout the book. And you can see where he's really trying to show how one becomes a rider or more importantly, how one becomes a horseman. Um, we don't start with just being passengers or we, his philosophy is that we shouldn't be settled with just being passengers. You can, you can sit on a horse and stay on top of them, but it's very different to actually spend the time and as you struggle and you go through the process as with learning any art, it sort of changes you and it changes your approach to the world. Uh, I think that's a large reason he will talk so much about how the noble fighting culture really was absolutely key that they learn about horses um, and that they're able to build their courage um, by doing that. Uh, these two photos, I actually had uh, borrowed my protege's horse because mine was being a toad, uh, borrowed my ho protege's horse who I hadn't ridden in forever for a castle charge. And, and having those moments where you've got that ingrained skill set makes it a lot easier to go forth and do some of the things that you need to do. So we do a lot with horses on different levels and from the most obvious to the most subtle. This next video we'll be going through and talking about something as simple as steering and all the different communication tools that you can bring to interacting with the horse and asking them to steer. There we go. Okay, so does anybody else have audio for the video? Okay, if it was, all right, I'll talk through. So what, what I was talking about, and remember, let me go ahead and mute it. Effectively, what happens is we start off with the easiest way to steer a horse is to pick up a rein and turn their head. I um, mean, that's the simplest standpoint. Where we go to from there is there's a few different ways we can make the horses move. They can go forward like we just did. We can actually ask them to come backwards and we can turn left and we can turn right. We can actually get to some more complex places. So that's the, that's the simplest level. That's basically just using our legs, turn left and right. It's kind of horse 101. We can also do things like use our foot or our ankle. I have a small spur on. And by putting a little bit of just a touch with a spur in his side and holding his front end steady, I'm able to move his hips over. By the same thing, I was able to put on my left spur 
in by his girth and hold his face steady, I'm able to move his shoulder over and get some sideways action that way. So we're getting into the next sort of level of rider that's involved. And then we start to get into some of the more subtle things that are a little difficult to see. In this instance, what I'm actually doing is I'm setting the shape of my pelvis and he is taking that bend through his body. He's changing the shape of his spine to match what my pelvis does. And because of that, I'm able to turn him just off the shape of my pelvis. So we will go ahead and go on from there. And this one's actually muted anyway. So this next bit is talking about sort of applying those same techniques into riding a simple pattern. Um, and what we're going to do on this very first pass, I'm going to steer just with my reins. I'm going to go ahead and neck rein because I've got a sword in my hand. And with just the neck reining, you can see relatively how he travels through. I'm going to disappear behind for a moment and he will come back. And on this one, I'm just using my legs to steer. And what we get, I actually miss one of the turns because he's not able to come back fast enough. On this final pass, I take all of those tools that we have put together and we're able to come up with a pattern that's much more smooth. You can see that he keeps closer to the target. The take home lesson from those two videos is really that you want to gonna you're going to want as a writer as you develop and you go on you develop more and more skills. Again, it becomes like any, any art. You can go through and you can sew on the simplest level, or you can learn advanced tailoring and how things interact. You can layer flavors in with food. There's different skills to this. And a lot of what he's trying to do is he, in this section, is trying to encourage people to have the desire to be among the most skillful because they're going to give, him great, give them great benefits. As we move from the will to the ability, Duarte talks about ability being divided up into physical aptitude as well as the means. Um, and these are actually really the same two things that we tend to come up with today when you talk about people why they don't ride. There may be lack of interest, but among the people who are interested, so who have the will, uh, physical aptitude is one that comes up. For example, uh, do you have weakness or obesity or old age? the we're not going to go ahead and play this part but but Duarte clearly says that obesity is not a limiting factor you know and speaking as a, a plus size rider there's a lot of things that come into play one of the most commonly touted uh one of the most commonly touted standards is 20 percent of the horse's body weight and there's a few things that is based this is based on but one of them is actually a study that was done in england modernly uh, and they took riders of intermediate le value level, skill level, and they put them on horses that were not fit, and they worked them bringing up to different levels of the body weight. And what they found is once they hit that 20% mark, they actually had, the horses that had a higher pulse and respiration. So they were working a little bit harder, carrying a higher percentage of their body weight. Makes sense but they were able to do it. And there are things that you can do if you are a plus size rider in terms of your fitness and the horse's fitness um, to ameliorate that. So, so all of those excuses and concerns of the body, they weren't enough then, they're not enough now. You can do these things if you have sufficient will and sufficient knowledge. Means is tougher. Um, certainly one of the uh, Money's, money is a factor, not only to purchase good horses, but to keep them up. Do you have the land? Do you have the ability? But the horses themselves become equivalent, for example, to a fine wine and have value in that regard. Um, down to the level where you've got to have the finest horse. If you want to be out and be the finest fighting man, you need to have the finest horse. And so there is no shame in asking your lord for a subsidy. So in this video, we're actually going to look at how the horses are involved in generating the movement of the sword. And so bringing their value to the fighting field. If I just drop a sword behind me, it just falls straight to the ground while my horse is, is standing still. There's no further motion. If I get past this part of the talking and get to the next part of the video, there we go. We're gonna start off at kind of a lazy walk where Moose is not actually doing a lot of work. 
And I get a little bit more movement of the sword than standing still, but not much. But if I ask Shirley, ask him to step up and carry himself and work like a good horse, I'm able to get the sword around back up of my head without providing any of the muscle power myself. That was actually all him. So next, we're going to go ahead and work in a nice forward trot. And again, we get a nice motion all the way around, straight up where we need it, all the power in the world to uh, do anything that I want. In the canter, we've got a backswing up, no problem. And if I go on a forward swing, that up and down motion of his stride is actually driving the motion of that sword. Um, I'm not providing any of that extra energy. In contrast, if I switch to the mule, who's a much flatter mover, which I get to, there we go. If I start in a walk and I let go, I basically get not much more motion than if I were just standing still. And if I ask him for a little bit of a trot, I get a little bit more, but not nearly as dramatic as with Moose. So you start to see the difference. Here's in the canter. And I can kind of get it around, but not really, and, and not that continual motion. So you start to see that difference between that flat moving mule, who's honestly easier to ride. Most SCA people would much rather ride Nick than Moose. Um, but the, the horse becomes almost a material good and a tool for the fighting man himself. So knowledge is actually a big part of helping with this ability. When you know something, you can go out and you can buy a horse that you're going to be able to develop into something greater. These are photos of Moose at various ages. Um, he did not start off knowing how to do all the things he does currently. He started off as kind of a gangly, skinny four-year-old. He was about 1,100. He, as a five-year-old, he was 1,150 pounds. He's probably 1,300 to 1,350 right now. I haven't had him on a scale since he was five. But you can go through and raise them and develop them into what you want, which also has the advantage if you brazenly and boldly asked her, you're at least able to get him a bargain. You're able to take care of his funds and do respectful things with them. So one of the next things that comes into play is uh, being strong. And this is the, the longest of the knowledge sections. It contains the descriptions of the five types of saddles, uh, which is one of the, the bits of technical advice that a lot of horsemen know from this book um, that they'll go through and they'll, they'll take and they'll apply to things. There's a lot of stuff about how to stay on a horse and how you can fall off and left and right and forward and back and all that. For those of you who are not horse people or who work in costuming, there's actually several good quotes similar to that shoe quote that talks about how the clothing should fit in order to justify um, riding. And there's a lot of real world philosophy that, uh, that definitely speaks to me as someone who grew up around horses. So we'll do just a little bit. One of the things he talks about is he talks about riding bareback or in a pack saddle and lumps the two of them together. And he talks about the position of your leg and what you should do and that, you know, if it all falls apart, it is possible to grab mane. So if you guys ever see me doing that riding, it's totally documentable. I actually have it not only from Duarte, but from Xenophon. Uh, but really the position when you are riding bareback is very similar to the sorts of things that you would ask for in uh, the sorts of things that you could ask for under saddle. The saddle provides a platform that I work from. It's not even for balance so much, but his back muscles are constantly moving underneath me. And so you can ride in bareback and I can drop my leg down underneath me, similar to where it is under saddle. Um, but you really have to work through those things. And, and the gist of what Duarte is talking about in his information on saddles is that a good horseman knows how to ride each kind of saddle and they ride appropriately to the task that they have as hand, as well as riding appropriately to the equipment that they're using in that moment. Fast forward a little bit, maybe. There we go. Just to show you guys that anything that's done with a saddle can be done without. We can uh, do a sitting trot. We can do a posting trot where I rise up out of the saddle. We can do two point. All of that's completely possible. So this is one of those philosophical quotes that comes about. And there's a lot of things that come in when you are working with horses and you are going through and working through problems. Um, getting angry doesn't necessarily make the process better. 
you have to learn a lot of emotional control that underlies your interactions with the animals, or at least it works best if you do. Some people never learn that. Often, I sometimes term it stubbornness, but often that mentality that comes through and that tenacity, uh, that perseverance to give it a virtue, comes into play with my interactions with others. We'll go ahead and hit play. This is actually just me doing some simple schooling with moose. Um, and actually part of what I'm talking about in this one, ah, is I'm talking about what happens if you get a little bit unbalanced. If I reach for a shot and I lean really far, you can see how I pull moose to the side and I have impacted his movement by changing my movement. By the same token, some folks will say, okay, well, I know I can move him around by putting my legs on. So if I put my leg on, he moves one way and then he moves the other. And, and so I'm not actually fixing the underlying issue. I'm sort of masking it by applying my aids as opposed to letting the horse work with his best freedom. Um, from that same moment, I'm probably saying something about getting him forward right about there. I can also go through and I can reach for something and I can get back and I didn't reach out as far and as I squared my hips up he squares up or I can lean I can reach I can do the leg thing I've got him going back and forth I've lost my ability to to ride in a straightforward fashion um, the best thing to do is to move the horse first and then pick the thing up so all kinds of simple cowboy logic things that are very applicable to your everyday dealings with the rest of the humans around you. Uh, talk a little bit about the emotional side of things and if you get a chance go back and watch this video this video and these next two videos actually. Um, it's worth it just to hear the frustration in my voice when I'm speaking. Um, go ahead. So check the uh, the sound on that briefly to make sure this was the video I thought it was. So a lot of what we're doing is I, on this particular day, he was having a bad day. I was not having a great day. We were fussing, we were fighting with each other. And we'll get to some riding here in a sec. There we go. So we were fussing and we were fighting with each other. And what I'm trying to ask him to do is I'm trying to ask him to move sideways while go, going around on the circle. And I really, really, really want to do this in a trot because I'm trying to build something up in his back end. Everything I was trying was not working. As a matter of fact, we'll go ahead and we'll do it in the trot. And what, what we've got from the horse is he's actually kind of curling up underneath himself and, and not taking responsibility for holding his own muscles up. He's starting to kind of evade the bit and try to get away from me. And I'm sort of working through it. And a lot of what I found is that when you get into those moments where you can't steer and the horse isn't doing what you want, you kind of have to take a deep breath, go back to the moment where it was working. Um, in this case, that involves dropping back down to a walk. Um, so we did, and we're still getting kind of up underneath himself and, and curling and not carrying himself as, as I want, not being in that strong position that's gonna generate the sword power. Um, and so what I did actually from this point is I gave you guys some basics where I asked him to lift himself up, and then I went ahead and I took a break. And I did a little bit more schooling off camera because sometimes you can't actually fix this in two minutes. So a little bit further process and understanding of how these sorts of things to do. Um, going back and looking at what I'm getting, I'm getting the horror smith himself and starting to get a little bit more uh, for the posture that I'm looking for from the horse for carrying himself. But he's still curling up a little bit and we're still getting frustrated and I'm tired because this is actually the end of a end of a workout and he's tired and I'm trying very, very hard not to fight, start a fight with the horse here and I'm trying to remember to go back and do the right things and all the stuff you're supposed to. And I can't tell you that Duarte had these same thoughts when he was interacting with counselors and he was frustrating. But I can tell you that I can take these lessons into my everyday work world and occasionally into my everyday SCA world and realize that that, um, that grace that occasionally comes from working with animals has a lot of skill and a lot of applicability in my everyday dealings with folks. So this is a little bit further along 
where we've had some more progress with him. I've started to get him to move up underneath himself. And so what we're actually going to start asking him to do as he's starting to carry himself in through the shoulders is we will ask him in a second. There. See, he's not curling underneath. He's actually, it's hard to tell. He's lifting right here through his neck as opposed to curling right there. As I ask him to back, you can see uh, what I want him to do is drop back through those haunches. And he's starting to carry himself with a little more balance. I'm starting to get that, that strong motion that I had in the sword video from him. A lot of this is, is very subtle, but it feels huge when you do it. So you keep repeating and you keep schooling and eventually you make progress and he's curling underneath himself so I'm lifting his hands and I'm looking I'm lifting my hands I'm looking for him to counteract the failing and because of that I'm actually starting to develop a horse with pretty good balance that that patience and that grace and that perseverance and that temperance is starting to pay off in the interactions I have with the horse and we're able to get a nice canter transition and we're able to get some useful motion out of him so that schooling process is the sort of thing that we go through every day when we're working horses to, to put together a good presentation. This is the physics of what I was, the biomechanics of what I was asking for. What I want him to do is I want him to use, his spine runs down here. I want him to use these muscles up here in his neck to lift the base of his spine up. And then these are the muscles of his back where he's carrying me. I actually want him to lift those up as well. Um, and he does not have collarbones, so he can actually lift his body relative to his shoulder. So that change in posture is a lot of what I'm looking for in here. So if I pick up contact with him, you can see he starts to engage through the neck, but he actually gets hollow through his back. If I ask him to engage his haunches and move forward a little bit, right there, I get a little lift in the spine. That's that hours of schooling and that muscling and that back and forth it's little small changes that we're looking for really much as if you're fine-tuning any other art um, and you for those of you who do practice other arts you may start to see some of this philosophy and some of this tenacity um, that, that goes along just with being an artist in general so moving into fear and being fearless um, and i will get to that question on bareback at the end uh, we actually had, I had somebody ask me a question on how did they shoot archery before they had stirrups? I am a safe mounted archer. I am not a tremendously efficacious one. So I went out to, to film this video one day and I did intelligent things like I took the mule who I've never shot off of and I did a couple of things with him. I generally shoot from a seated position. I wanted to get some demonstrations of shooting from a two point, so standing, standing up above the horse and letting him move underneath me. Um, I wanted to do a few of those things. So the being fearless where that comes in, you know, you, you never know when things are gonna come into play, but as a rider, you have a balance of fearlessness that's absolutely crucial at the same time that you have prudence. And sometimes it's the prudence itself that allows you to do that, having horses that are prepared. Um, this mule is dead steady. I hadn't shot on him before, but I had done a lot of other things with him. As soon as he learned the pattern, he was good to go. Um, and perfect. So we've got the combination. These are just the six things working without the stirrups so that I can demonstrate for the person what the possibilities are. So, for this display on horsemanship question, are you thinking like ride before the prince? Okay, move on from that one. So, we talk about prevention and going through and making sure that you understand what the hazards are that are around. I had somebody ask me a question about how do you mount and dismount in garb? So I did a quick demo on that one. And one of the things, I cover a couple of simple safety things that come into play. Um, take off extraneous sorts of materials that are involved. Um, go through, pass that along to somebody, have a header, have a platform that you're moving to, uh, covering all of those sorts of things. Where this comes into play, this is not specific advice that Duarte gave us in terms of how do you dismount from a horse and garb? He doesn't actually cover that kind of thing. 
But this is really a lot of what he's talking about in terms of recognizing the hazards. A lot of keeping yourself safe as a horseman is the things you learn from experience. You learn that stuff can get caught, you learn that garb can get caught on the back of the saddle, so then you start to take preventions to avoid those sorts of things. And a lot of where that comes down to, again, sticking with that idea of being fearless is not only do we recognize the causes of the fear and how to prevent them, it gives us sort of a path forward in how to improve because not only are we schooling the horse, a lot of times we're schooling ourselves and we want to take that fearlessness. If you're paralyzed with fear when you're learning a dangerous activity, you're never actually going to get anywhere in terms of acquiring the knowledge. So having ways that you can come to terms with that are helpful um, and again, become applicable to the rest of your world. So from there, we move on to fluidity. And we talked a little bit about how Moose moves and how he's different than Nick moves. Where the key thing comes in with fluidity, this video is actually just on my uh, basic position um, and looking at it. A lot of what we're looking at at this point is the motion of the horse. If you look right here at my belt line and you look at how much my hips move back and forth. Um, one translator calls this fluidity, the other calls it ease. I actually kind of like ease. Um, that you need to go through and with a high energy, high motion athletic horse like Moose, you need to have a great deal of flexibility in how you ride. Um, and that will come into play in the movements and being able to do all the things that you want to do. Let's go ahead. We've got a little clip here at the trot. At the beginning, I actually ride with fairly stiff hips for two or three strides, and you'll watch me bounce pretty hard, and then I go through and I, I relax and add some fluidity so that you can see that bit of motion. So right here, you're going to watch. There's a lot of stiffness, and I am pounding on the horse, and we're going through from there. If the video is going to behave. Perfect. And then as we start to relax, not only do I relax, the horse starts to relax and the horse starts to move underneath himself. If I stop my hips from moving, Moose stops moving. Um, and that makes a big difference. Um, so looking at all of those bits and pieces and what I'm doing. I wanted you guys to see that so I could set you up for this next part because that fluidity and that ease, some of which comes from 10,000 hours, practicing something over and over again to the point where it's rote memory. This is actually a visual in terms of how one can use a lance on these two types of moving horses. Yeah, the belling dancing is kind of similar. I'll, I, been teaching one of our local folks a little bit about it. I'll cover that for you a little more in depth in the questions. So here we've got my stiff hips and my fluid hips at the walk and the trot with the mule. You really don't see a lot of movement on the, the lance tip. As with the sword, he's pretty, he's pretty steady. At the canter, he kind of trips behind and you'll watch my lance takes a pretty big bob there. But other than that, there's not a lot of motion and movement. So he makes it easier. He doesn't take nearly as much fluidity and ease to rise. If I ride moose with loose hips, you can see how steady the, the spear is. If I tighten my hips up, I have not moved my arm. All of that motion you're seeing is actually just from me stiffening up my hips and all the horse's motion being translated to the spear. We repeat that here in the sitting trot, nice and steady loose hips, and then I tighten up and you get the, mo the movement of the spear. We're going to do the same thing here in a moment in the canter. So loose hips and tight hips. So that fluidity and that ease, you know, Duarte is talking about applying it to um, a little bit of philosophy as well as is riding itself. But it is something that's very fundamental and it's something that I didn't learn when I rode easy horses. You know, Nick is never going to teach you that. It's something as you start to get to the more difficult horses, and I think it's one of the reasons he recommends not putting the young kids, not stepping them back to the easy horses. Constantly give them a little bit of a challenge, not so much that you scare them, but enough that they're forced to develop their skills and work and think 
and continue on towards mastery. Um, so we'll get back to this. This is the last slide. I will make sure you guys all have a copy of this presentation so you can go back and listen with the sound. Um, there's some resources there, but I, there's a couple of good questions here in the chat that I want to go through and address. So starting with the reasons you would choose to ride bareback. Um, he talks about it in terms of, uh, it, he sort of presents it as more of a, almost a lower class thing, or you're just hopping on this horse, you've, you've got a pack horse that doesn't have a saddle on it, and so you go and you're going to ride bareback. Um, much of Duarte's framing of how, to, how and when to use the saddles is they are, it's what's presented to you. And I think for him, for someone who's at a lordly level, um, you ought to have that skill set, even though you yourself will likely always have access to horses that have saddles. Um, and going back, so the next question was, he, does he spend any talking, time talking about displays in horsemanship? Um, and particularly talking to like Pluvenel or perhaps uh, some, you have some familiarity with Grissoni or Blundville or any of those. Um, there is not a ride before the prince display type thing. He does talk a lot about your attitude and your posture, and I believe one of the topics he didn't cover was, was uh, elegance that he planned on covering. But, but there's a smattering of it throughout the work, um, and he will talk about do X because it's more elegant. You know, if the horse bucks, you might be able, you, yes, you can reach forward and grab the mane, but that's not elegant. But you might be able to sneak a hand down and grab onto the saddle to keep from being thrown forward, and that looks much more graceful. He definitely is talking about the artistry that goes with riding and the artistry of equitation um, in pieces of this, but it's not a specific formal demonstration. It's more in the terms of the fact that horse people then and now are super judgy. And so here's how you look like a good horse person. And he specifically talks about for anyone that any of the fighting men that should know this skill and don't, they deserve to be judged. So there's definitely a interpersonal peer group judgment that comes into play. And, and not only, you know, if you don't have the skill, you're not going to be a good horseman and you're not going to be a good fighter. And as a matter of fact, you may as well just be a craftsman or an entertainer. The riding and doing it elegantly is definitely something he saw as an eleva elevated skill set that was a fundamental portion of being part of the nobility. Let me know if that answered your question. Um, and then I will get to Um Jabril's question. Um, yeah, so I was actually teaching a friend, uh, Mirma came out and was taking a riding lesson and we were talking, and I took a belly dance class with her. We talked a little bit about the separation when you're belly dancing between what your hips are doing and what your shoulders are doing. And there's a tremendous crossover in the concept and the goal. What we have found from teaching each other is how we go about accomplishing it differs because a lot of what you're doing in riding is I'm lifting and supporting to get that amount of flexibility. I lift and support at the base of my rib cage. As a matter of fact, the, the muscles that get really sore when I complain about my abs from riding the horse, they're right at the, the base of the sternum. Um, right tucked up in between that narrow part. Let me try standing up. Right about here is the muscles that I use for riding that particular horse. Um, the belly dancing muscles, you're using those muscles to drive the motion. A lot of what I'm doing is I am using the muscles to relax, and I mostly let moose drive the motion. I will occasionally stop the motion of my hips and use that to stop his motion, or I will be even more fluid and ask him to go forward and he will give me even bigger motion. But it's not, from my limited knowledge of belly dance, it's not the same kind of curl and power and that lower abdominal control that you guys have to do the isolations. Okay, so much. Oh, the old texts are super relevant today. I, I can't remember how how long ago it was I read this one in particular for the first time and it really kind of felt like reverse documentation because having um, ridden horses for 30 plus years at that point at this point I've been riding for 40 plus um, there was a lot of stuff that was just kind of well yeah gee whiz of course yes that's exactly how you do that 
um, because there was so much of a trial and error basis. And I actually, looking over the literature now, one of the things I have to check myself for is um, validation bias to make sure that I am not assuming I know what they talk about because they say something that, that hits with my experiences as a horse person. I sometimes have to go back and look a little more closely at the text and look at the tools that they have and how close can I get to their tools with the things I have access to that are the right size that I feel are humane for my horse. So, and here's the 15 Do we have any more. other questions? Perfect. Mm -hmm. That's about great. Let me go ahead and I will give you guys a, that uh, link to the presentation one more time and I will post this everywhere um, so that you guys can go back if you're interested and you can listen to it with sound. I'll go ahead. If you guys aren't going to ask questions, I'll just keep talking at you. So these are some additional resources. One, if you have never read this text and you and any of this sounds remotely interesting, pick up a copy of one of the translations. They're not expensive. Um, they're super easy to read. They're small. They look good on a bookshelf. Um, well worth buying the book. Um, this is actually where I keep uh, all of my, my thoughts and my projects on my horsemanship stuff. Um, so there's a little bit more information there in terms of the things I've done with moose and that sort of thing. I, I was trying to cover it on a fairly superficial level today so that it would be accessible to non-riders. If you're a rider and you want to geek on stuff, this is where I get a little more geeky. Um, I have a Google a database that, hey, that works even better if I hit send. There we go. Um, I have a Google database that I keep quotes from various uh, period authors as I trip across them and a bunch of resources and links to um, online things. So if you're looking to do get some more documentation and looking at the written record, I actually find the written record is often much more useful for trying to sort out what they were doing with writing than the artistic record because it's Sometimes you can confirm the artistic bias or figure out how to how to translate it, but I really like working from the period writings because there are some great uh, manuals from a variety of cultures from many, 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 many centuries. Um, for particularly for those of you that are not typically riders, uh, Horse Lovers Two Minutes has been my uh, quarantine project. Most of the videos that you saw in this presentation came from that. So I sit down and I do simple two-minute videos talking about trying trying to demystify some of the things we're up, doing up there on our horses because I want all of you to be able to be judgmental of the riders just like Duarte would have wanted you to be. So there's a Facebook group for that. There's also a YouTube playlist that has all those videos if you ever want to kill some time and, and see some simple stuff. To move beyond my personal things, uh, the Works of Chivalry blog uh, covers a lot of, it's, they're actually, it's a well-written blog. It's written by a journalist out of um, Italy and does a nice job looking at some of the primary sources for equestrianism and uh, bringing it down to an understandable level. So if you like kind of a surface look at some of the books, maybe you don't want to do a deep dive yourself, that's a good one to check out occasionally. If you're going to do horses in the SCA, the Facebook group's always a good one. For digesting information, um, Modern History TV, actually, and they, they tend to look specifically at the fighting horses. I, I, I cover all horses. I'm interested in all horses. But they do some really nice videos on a practical level of what's, what's capable, what could possibly happen. And he rides well, and he has good explanations. Uh, Arna Kutz has a YouTube channel. He does amazing recreations of mounted combat, Roth Specton, uh, and um, jousting, and looking at the underpinnings of what needed to be done with a horse in order to make that happen. It has some really good explanations and is a fantastic teacher if you get a chance to watch his work. This is actually the YouTube channel for a uh, Lusitano breeder in Portugal who breeds uh, his primary use for his horses actually are bullfighting horses, and he breeds uh, Aribe Lusitanos. 
he's a fantastic guy to ride with, but he comes up with a background in the traditional um, 20th century Portuguese military education and all of those levels, as long as as well as being a lifelong horseman. And what I like about his stuff is you can see good demonstrations of a lot of the um, some of the bits and pieces and underpinnings of horse mu movement you'll here described in the primary sources. So it's a nice place to go look because you everyone's got their own feelings on bullfighting. Um, but because it's one of those places that probably most close still most closely resembles in mounted combat, it's sort of an experimental milieu for those applied movements to be used in a way that they're still being used with weapons and danger and movement. Um, so this particular YouTube channel, it's none of it's bullfighting, it's all unmounted stuff, but you can get to see the kind of moment, movements that he has. And this one is the link to the extant copy of the work. And with that, I think I filled my 50 minutes. Yes, you did. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recording.